everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today we've got a great problem on magnetic induction. We're going to use Faraday's law here, and here is the problem. Uh, we have a square loop that moves in a region of uniform magnetic field. Uh, the magnitude of that field is 0.8 Tesla, and that loop is moving here at a velocity of 10 meters per second. Uh, we're telling you the resistance of this loop is 0 0.1 ohms, and that point of that uh, square loop here is going to enter the field at time zero. We've got four questions to look at today. We're gonna first find the current in the loop. There is going to be an induced current. Let's find the direction and the magnitude as a function of time. Next, we'll make a quick sketch of what that current looks like as a function of time from T0 to 0 0.2 seconds. Uh, I'm also interested in what is the maximum current that you're going to get and what is the position of the loop when you're going to get the maximum amount of current. All right, so uh, like with all of my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, so let's examine a little bit of the physics first. So this loop is moving here to the right side as shown. And on the right side, I'm showing you that there is a magnetic field that is pointing into the page that's denoted by these X values. Now, what happens here? So right now, there is no current in that loop. But eventually, what you're going to do here is you're going to start entering the magnetic field region. And at some point, the loop is going to look exactly like this. Now, what's going on here? As this loop now is moving inside the field region, what do you have now? You have a loop that is entering a magnetic field. That means that there is now flux, magnetic flux that is increasing here as this loop moves. There are more and more magnetic field lines that are going through this loop. Well, Faraday tells us something, that whenever there is a magnetic flux that is changing with respect to time, what are we doing? We are going to induce an EMF in this loop, okay? And this is Faraday's law right here, allows us to calculate how big that induced EMF will be. It's equal to minus the change in flux with respect to time. That negative sign here is important because it tells us that the EMF that we're going to induce is going to be in the direction such that it opposes the change in flux. The loop doesn't want the flux to change, so what we're going to do is we are going to induce an EMF that tries to uh, produce a current, an induced current, that itself produces a magnetic field that will oppose this change in flux. All right, so what happens over here? So the magnetic flux is increasing, so it should tell you right away that um, if I don't want the flux to change, I better induce a magnetic field here that is in the opposite direction of this red uh, field lines here that are entering the loop. So right away, you should be able to deduce here that to oppose that change in flux, I would have to induce my own magnetic field, produce my own magnetic field that points in the opposite direction here of this uh, red field that I've denoted. Okay, so now we have to find what is the direction here of the induced current. Well, the direction of the induced current is the direction that will produce a magnetic field here that is pointing out of the page, this B induced. For that, you have to use the right-hand rule, and if you know how to use the right-hand rule, then you should be able to conclude that that induced current then must be in this counterclockwise direction. That kind of current is going to produce here this induced magnetic field that is coming out of the page. Okay, so at least we have now the direction of this induced current. My goal now is to go back and apply Faraday's law in order to calculate what is the magnitude of that EMF and then we're gonna use it here to actually calculate this induced current magnitude. Okay, so we're gonna start up here with a Faraday's law. Okay, Faraday, Faraday's law indicates that the EMF is equal to minus the rate of change of this magnetic flux with respect to time. Okay, so the derivative of the flux with respect to time. Now I'm gonna just start off with just this little section here. Let's start off with this diagram, and we're just gonna denote this distance here. So there's a certain region here that has entered the field region. And if this is a perfect square, then I can denote this as the distance x, and that means that that angle here is 45 degrees, so the adjacent side, or the opposite side should also be x. Okay, we're gonna use this in a little bit in order to calculate what the area is. But let's first recall what is our definition of magnetic flux. 
if the field is constant, and it is in this case, uh, the magnetic flux can simply be written as this value right here. So B is the magnitude of the field. A will be the area inside this magnetic field, so we'll have to calculate this. And now this angle theta here, again, the angle theta is the angle between the magnetic field, which is into the page, and also the area vector, which the area vector points perpendicular to the surface. But in this case, you can see that that angle theta is simply going to be zero because my area is either going in or out of the page. So we have zero here for that uh, angle theta. All right, the next thing we want to do is you want to calculate the entire area here of this triangle that is inside that magnetic field region. Again, you either break it down into two triangles, and each triangle has an area as one half base times height. But since you have two of them, what you end up getting here is that the area is simply going to be equal to x squared, and that's it. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna go back and think about, let's think about Faraday's law right here. Since the magnetic field is uniform, if I'm differentiating the flux, let's think about what is changing over here. The field is uniform, so you, can, you don't have to take the derivative of a uniform field because it's constant. So you can take that outside of this derivative, and now you're left with the area, and the area is what is changing when this loop enters the field region. So if I go back and I substitute uh, my flux definition inside Faraday's law, this is what we're left with. I've put the B here out in the front, and now I have to differentiate this area here with respect to time. Well, the area is simply x squared. Uh, B is constant. Uh, we've said that before, so let's just substitute the area here inside my Faraday's law. Okay, so that's what we're left with. Now keep in mind here, I'm taking the derivative with respect to time of x squared. But as this loop moves inside the field region, this x is changing. So x is not a constant, right? You're going to have more and more area going into that magnetic field region. So x is really a function of time right here. So when you differentiate this, uh, we're going to apply the chain rule. So we're going to first differentiate it with respect to x. And then we're going to be left with dx over dt. So this is what this looks like now when I've substituted everything in here. Uh, you may not want to keep the negative sign. The negative sign is important because that is the Lenz's law contribution, right? It allows us to calculate the direction of that induced current. Uh, but if you're just interested in the magnitude, just drop that negative sign. Not a big deal. All right, so what are we left with now? Well, again, dx over dt here, which appears in my induced EMF, this is really nothing more than the speed of the object, right? We're moving this loop to the right at constant speed, so we can go ahead and substitute here dx over dt for that speed v. And this is what I'm left with now for the induced EMF. Minus 2 bx times v. All right, um... We can simplify this one more step. Remember, since the speed is constant then, uh, I do have that that position x, right? That distance here that this loop is entering the field should vary linearly with time. It's just simply v times t. So let's go ahead and substitute uh, that quantity up here for this x value. And this is what you're left with now. At least when this first part of the triangle of the loop is entering the field. This is what I have right now, okay? Um, I get a linear dependence with time. So let's go ahead and box that up. That is going to be an important result for us. Now, if I'm interested now in the induced current when this first section here enters that magnetic field region, uh, we've given you the resistance of that loop. So what you have to do now is simply take that EMF and um, divide by the resistance of the loop, and we're going to be left with my induced current. Again, the induced current is going to be proportional to that EMF. It's also proportionate to time. So let's go ahead and box that up. Okay, so we are in a great position right now. So let's go ahead and just make this first plot and analyze uh, these equations. All right, so we have our induced current uh, equation right here, and what this says is that it increases linearly, but it's important that it only increases linearly right up until you reach this point right here. After that, my equation for the area is certainly going to be more complicated. It's not just going to be x squared anymore. So we're gonna analyze this second part over here in just a little bit, but let's at least uh, figure this part, part out. So x goes from zero all the way to when the loop is halfway through or inside that magnetic field. Uh, so we should be able to figure this out because the length of this square is L. 
So that means that uh, from this point to this point, we should have root 2 of L if you use Pythagorean theorem. Um, so that means that this value of X right now, the way that I have it in the figure, uh, should be half of that value. Uh, go ahead and multiply the top and the bottom by square root of 2, and we're left here with this maximum value of x here, um, at least shown in the figure, is L over root 2. All right, again, we know that the uh, position is linear with time. It's simply the speed times the time. Therefore, you can find this maximum amount of time here, or the time that it takes for the loop to reach this point here in the figure. Simply take the x value that I had, L over root 2, and divide it by the speed. All right, now, well, now you can go back and substitute this inside my current equation, and this is going to allow us to solve for what is the maximum amount of current you're going to induce in that loop. All right, just go ahead and I substitute time into that expression. I've dropped the negative sign here because I'm only interested in here in the magnitude of that current, the direction we figured out early in the video. Uh, maybe I'll just rearrange this, uh, bring the... 2 and the square root of 2 in the front here, um, and you can cancel out one of the velocity terms. You can see you have a velocity squared in the numerator and a velocity in the de denominator, and this is what you're left with. So this is actually my maximum amount of current that I'm going to get when the loop is in this position. All right, now we can go ahead and rewrite this now simply as root 2 times uh, BVL. So that's the maximum current that you're going to get. And now we go ahead and make the sketch. So when this loop is entering that magnetic field region, the current is increasing linearly right up until it reaches the midpoint, and that is the maximum current right up here. All right, the second part now, what I want to do now is let's have a look at what happens now when the loop is leaving. Now, you would probably guess that it is going to be a symmetric function, and you would be a very good guesser. Uh, but I do want to go ahead and calculate. It's a little bit different because now the area is getting smaller as time progresses. The area is still changing, but the rate at which the area is changing is getting smaller. So let's go set up the second part of this problem now. All right, so in the second part here, what we're doing now is we're going to analyze now when this loop is still moving to the right, but it's from the midway point all the way to the end point. Okay, so we're going to start off just by defining some distances here on this diagram. So we have diagonal to diagonal is root 2 multiplied by L, and I'm going to call this little distance here that's outside of the field region. Let's just define it by little d. All right, the loop is still moving. Um, so we still have this, and x, again, is the position of inside the loop here, but everything is moving to the right at v times t. All right, so how would we write the area here of what's inside uh, the field region? What I could do is I could define it as being the total area of this loop, which is just L squared, and then take away the little bit of area here that's not inside the loop. I think that would probably be a pretty easy way of doing it. So if I can write it then similarly to what I did before, because the area outside the loop now is simply going to be d squared. Remember, all you have are two triangles. Each triangle has an area one half d squared base times height. And that means if you sum them together, you get d squared for that area. And l squared is the total area of the loop. So this area A defines all of this region here that is inside the loop. All right, um, now using this uh, definition right here, well, guess what? We also have D here that will be defined then as root 2L minus X, where again, let me just put X on this figure here. X is this distance here. All right, so uh, what do we want to do now? Well, let me just substitute the D here inside that area. Okay, uh, this is what we have. Um, and what we're interested in now for the flux, remember the flux before was given by Faraday's law. That induced EMF, right, that we wanted to was equal to minus B multiplied by dA over dt. And this is the key point. So what I have to do now is I need to evaluate what dA over dt is. But I have an expression for A, and the only variable here that depends on time will be this distance x right here. So we're going to differentiate this with respect to time. This is a constant term. You don't have to worry about it. And you have to use the chain rule here to evaluate this because it is squared. So if we do that, dA over dt ends up being this quantity here. So you differentiate this whole thing first with respect to x, 
Two comes out of the front of the parentheses, and at the end, you have to differentiate what is inside the parentheses, so you get minus dx over dt. Well, again, using this similar definition to what we had before, dx over dt is really nothing more than the speed of this square loop. So I substitute that for v. The negative signs cancel out, and we're left with this expression. Now, if you wanted to here, we could replace this x value by our quantity vt, and now we have an expression here for the rate of change of the area in inside that loop. Okay, so here's the rate of change of the area. We go ahead now and substitute our expression into Faraday's law. Uh, this is what it looks like, just taking that term, substituting inside here. Uh, that means that the current now is simply going to be this EMF divided by the resistance of the loop. And if we're worried about just the magnitude of it, just drop that negative sign. And this is our expression right here. So let's go now have a look at what this looks like in a couple, uh, having the loop in various positions. We can see what it looks like when it's at the midway point, and we can see what it looks like when the loop is completely inside the field. All right, let's look at case one. In case one, we have that the position x is halfway in the loop. That's root 2 L over 2. That's the x definition. Uh, again, that equals to vt at that specific instant in time. What you go into is you substitute into my expression for that current. So what do we have? 2bv uh, divided by the resistance. Here we have root 2 multiplied by L, then minus this distance. This is root 2 L over 2. Uh, what you could see here is, well, we could factor out a bunch of terms here. R here you're going to be left with, let's just factor out root 2 times L. And here you're left with 1 minus 1 half. A 1 minus 1 half is just 1 half. So let's just substitute that whole thing by uh, 1 half. And what you're left with is that the 1 half is going to cancel out with that 2 right here. And you're going to be left with uh, root 2 BVL over R. Guess what? This is the exact same result that we previously had uh, for the maximum current. So let me just write that down, same as before. All right, let's have a look at one more case. All right, so here's case two. Case two, what do we have? We have X now. The loop is completely inside that uh, field region. So X is equal to root two multiplied by the length, and that is V multiplied by T. I go ahead and substitute VT by root two over L, and look what you get. <laughs> You're going to get two BV over the resistance, and look at this term root 2L minus, again, VT is also root 2L. So the current at this point, guess what, goes to zero, okay? That's really, really important because now the flux is no longer changing. You always have the same amount of feel that is crossing uh, that area of the loop. At the last step now, we'll just substitute some numbers and see what's going on. So we have our I max value, the I max value again, uh, the magnetic field is 0.8 Tesla. The speed was 10 meters per second. The length of the loop was 10 centimeters here, the length of one side. Uh, you go ahead and substitute everything in there with the resistance of 0 0.1 ohms. You get a very large current of 11.3 amps. So that is my maximum value up here. Uh, this time max was, uh, again, substituting our values. You know that the time for half the loop to enter here, um, I put in the numbers and I get something that is around seven milliseconds. Okay, and the next time then, that means that the total time then for that loop to be completely inside that field region would be 14 milliseconds. Now that means that we were asked initially to draw what the current looked like all the way to 0.02 seconds, but then the current will simply be zero for the rest of that time that's remaining. Okay, so this is kind of a very, very nice problem. It's a little bit harder than just having the square loop uh, you know, just in a regular orientation here, having it rotated a little bit makes that area calculation a little bit harder and makes this problem a little bit harder. Anyway, hopefully you understood the steps and you are ready to tackle any magnetic induction problem. We'll see you next time.